Hi everybody, I'm RJ with Brew Chatter and I'm here today with Colby Frey from Frey Ranch Estate Distillery. Yep. And uh, so he's taken us through this whole estate, which sounds like a ton of work, and it, it, but it's, it's super cool and the products are insanely good. So we're just kind of hanging out, talking, and we're gonna see where you guys started and, and how all of this came to be. Yeah, thank you for coming. So yeah, it all started, my family started farming in Nevada in 1854. It was 10 years before Nevada was even considered a state, which was in 1864. And we've been continually farming ever since. And so it was our love of farming and creating something out of our products that led us to the distillery. So our particular farm, my grandpa bought in 1944. Um, and it used to be owned by Senator Robert Douglas. It really, it's a really kind of a historic place here in Fallon. And it's really known for its quality of soil and the ability to grow really high quality grains. So the wheat, rye, barley, and corn that's in all of our products is all grown right here on the farm. And we do what it takes um, to create the best quality, not necessarily the biggest quantity, like most farmers would do, you know, if they were selling it on the open market. So it's really important that we, to us that we grow our own grains. Uh, and that's so cool. Uh, we were talking before, and you have all of this control, and you're not you're not worried about sacrificing, like you said, some quantity to get a higher quality grain, so that you can have a higher quality product. Absolutely. And like when we're growing grain, when you are talking about starches and proteins, they're actually inverse. When starch goes up, protein goes down, and it's vice versa. There's certain fertilizers that if we put them on the fields, the protein would go up and the starch would go down. Now, in the broad scheme of things, that would be good if you're selling it to the cattle market or anything else. High proteins are good. But for us, we want high starch and lower proteins. And so it's really important to not add these fertilizers, even though it drastically reduces our yields. And so by growing it ourselves and not just buying it on the open market, we can ensure that we're getting the best quality. There's a lot of other things that go into it too, which um, you know, here on this particular farm is ideal for growing high quality and the best quality grains in the world. Nice. Well, and it's insane too, because when we were going through the distillery, uh, you're, you, you've got a run going, full mash, you know, all the, all the grain, everything's in there, homogenized, going through that, that continuous still. And then it goes right out onto a trailer and right over to the dairy farm next door. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really unique process because we, we grow all the grains here. We, dist we, uh, uh, we mill it here, we mash in, ferment it, distill it, age it, bottle it, everything right here. But the byproducts, which you're talking about, are the solids and the liquids. And the solids go to the dairy next door and get fed to the dairy cows. The liquids actually go onto our fields and they're really acidic. And our ground here is alkaline. And so that acidic liquid helps balance the pH in the soil so we can grow a better crop. And so it's really efficient. We're not wasting anything. We even have um, a, a cooling pond that cools the stills and everything else so we don't have to have a, a big glycol uh, antifreeze chilling system and everything else and this is the kind of a unique part um, some people like it some people don't but the dairy produces a lot of manure from the cows we put that on the fields it's the best fertilizer there is it has a lot of nutrients it's the best it's not commercial you know crappy fertilizer it's the best and so we put that back on the field so that we can grow a better crop so it's like a full circle you know we're producing something, selling the byproducts to the dairy, getting the manure, putting it back on the field and, and improving everything in a natural way. That is, that is so cool. And I, I, don't think, I don't think people really realize the work that goes into, like it's, it's cool to say, yeah, it's an estate distillery, but the work that actually goes into the, the you guys go through, the growing, everything is. It's a tremendous amount of work. Um, but the unique part or the best part is, is that we have our hands on every part of it so that we can ensure that it's done right the way that we want it. And we, we are sacrificing, like we said, quantity for quality. And um, we can do that by doing it ourselves, but it also ensures there's no bad pesticides put on anything. There's, everything's grown right, stored right, the right temperatures, the right, you know, everything. So um, it ensures the better final product that way. Absolutely. Well, and, uh, Kind of hit me. You're, you're, you're growing your grain with your grain. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. It's and so, and that's why we can get those kind of. Uh, I know this term is used all the time, but heirloom varieties. You know, yeah. we actually have our own varieties that grow well here. That that do that we harvest year after year. So we're able to create our own little, um, you know, climate, our own little product here that that is unique to us only. That nobody else can really replicate. So that's. 
it's so cool. And uh, we were we were just talking about your gin, the the artemisia, the the sagebrush that you use is right outside the door. Yep. The the junipers or Rocky Mountain Nevada junipers, right on the way to the the big barrel house that we were looking at. It's, yeah. uh, that's so cool. Yeah, we tell everybody the gin especially, it, it smells like Nevada right after a rainstorm when you smell it. And that's the sage and the junipers. It's like what Nevada up in the mountains smells like right after the rain. Absolutely, such an apt description. So I've had the vodka, wonderful. I've had the gin, stellar. Um, I've only had your brandy as far as a barrel aged product. Mm -hmm. um, but we're in this beautiful barrel house. Uh, what, how, what, what's your process like with barrel aging? So we're aging everything a minimum of four years. We actually have some whiskey right now that is four years or older. It, it was actually November. So right now it's four years and a few months old. Um, right now we're working on packaging for our bottles and everything else. It'll be, uh, whiskey will be available this summer and um, we're really proud of it. It's really good. We've, we've told everybody from the beginning since we filled up our first barrel, it'll be a minimum of four years old. If it's not where we want it in four years, we'll wait until five or six or whatever it takes. We wanna make sure that it's the best quality product right, out of the, right off the bat. And, but it was really good at three years and, and so right at four years, we were ready to go, but we're still working on a, a packaging design and everything else and we're gonna release it this summer. Oh, that's so cool. I cannot wait for that. So uh, your barrels, you're using, a, you said it's a number four char yep. inside, minimum of four years in the barrel. Yep. Um, so I, I know that a lot of the, like Jack and these, these giant monster distilleries, they have these, these big barrel warehouses and they're adjusting top to bottom and everything. Uh, what's, what's your process here at Freyford? So just because, you know, those are 10 stories high. And so the difference between the temperatures that, you know, 10 stories high and the, the, the ground level is, is dramatic, you know. Here, ours aren't that tall. Um, this barrel warehouse we're in right now will only hold 1,456 full-size 53-gallon barrels. Oh, that's all. Our new barrel house <laughs> will hold um, about 8,400 barrels. And, um, but the unique part about it is, is it's more level. We have lots of ground here. We don't need to build them 10 stories high. So we don't have the dramatic um, temperature differences. But we will take kind of a cross section when we do bottle the, the whiskey, you know, take some barrels from the top and blend it with the barrels from the bottom and, awesome. and get a good um, consistent product that way. Awesome, that's very cool. So what if, uh, uh, we, uh, there are a lot of people who, you know, study the theory of home distilling. Mm -hmm. And, and barrel aging seems to be like 53 gallon barrel, surface area to volume is perfect. Mm -hmm. the, the char's just right, it's like the planets align and that's the perfect size. But what about for those of us who are using like cubes or staves or spirals or something along those lines, uh, do you have any recommendations? You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, especially, I mean, it's hard to fill up a full 53 gallons, um, you know, uh, and so, um, one thing that I would recommend, one thing that the barrels do is they breathe slightly mm -hmm. and they're charred. And so make sure your chips are charred. Um, you know, you can get them at different toasts or whatever. Um, you want to get the right charred chips, but you got to be really careful because I think that um, you could really overdo it that way if you put in a little bit too much. And so I would add a little bit and add a little bit more. But one thing that, that you just can't replicate is time, you know, and it's, it's that contact with the charcoal and um, you know, in this barrel house, it's the expansion and contraction of the cold winters and the hot summers. It expands during the cold winters, pushes it into that char level and contracts during the cold winters. And so um, it's, that's really important for the aging process for us. And any way that a home brewer could kind of replicate that would be really good, you know. Okay, awesome. So put the jars on the, uh, in the freezer. Yeah. And put them on the heater vent. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I love it. Awesome. So uh, when, when you're distilling, when you're running this, this beautiful system that you've got set up, um, I, I thought it was really cool that you had a, a continuous still and in tandem with your pot still. Um, could you talk a, a little bit about your process? And yeah, when we were designing it, we felt like a continuous stills are really efficient. You get a lot, a lot of product in a you know, relatively efficient, fast yeah. period of time. So. But a pot stills we felt like do a lot better quality. You can take a heads cut and then you get the middle run and you can take a tails cut. And so what we do is we strip everything in the continuous still. 
and then we redistill it in the pot still as a pot rather than having a doubler. A lot of continuous stills would have a continuous still and the doubler. The problem is there's no way to differentiate the heads and the tails. And so by stripping it in the continuous still, we're making the pot still a lot more efficient because we're putting in a lot more concentrated product. And then we take a heads cut and then a, we collect the middle run and then a tails cut. And that really allows us to get a lot better quality and it allows us a lot more control over our final product. Nice. So you don't have to use a doubler or a, a, a thumper, right? Yep. Same, thumper, same yeah. sort of thing. You, you can put a more pure product in from a stripping run mm -hmm. and, and have total control and get exactly what you want. Yeah, and so there's, there's a saying that, you know, alcohol is one of the things that gives you hangovers and kind of, you know, whatever. But a lot of the other at attributing factors to that are the other conjugers that, are, that come off in the heads run, you know. And so by us taking those off, it just creates a better product all around. Absolutely, get rid of all those higher alcohols and, and just have a nice, Hearts laden product. Yeah. So you're even doing your um, your your vodka and your your gin base on in, in the pot still as well, right? Yes. And then running it through that other column. Yeah. So there, there's the the vodka column. So what we would do is we'd strip everything in the continuous still, redistill it through the pot still, and then redirect all the steam through the vodka column. And that's just the high proofing column. So if we're making vodka, the definition has to be 95% alcohol or more. Um, ours comes out at 98% alcohol, which is extremely hard to get that high of proof. And then um, there's an airplane <laughs> buzzing us. I think it's my cousin Jerry. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So. Um, Anyway, so when we get, it, it's, it, it, when it goes through that vodka column, it gets pure as it goes up the column. That's how we can get high proof. Now, if we're making whiskeys or brandies or, or a lot of other products, we don't want it to get that high proof. We want some of the flavors to stay in it. So we would only distill it to 60 to 70% alcohol. That means some of the flavors are staying with the, the whiskey or the brandy. Gotcha. So for, for your whiskeys and stuff, you, you, try to, you try to stick in that 140, 160, 140 kind yeah, of? Yeah, and it depends on what kind of whiskey we're making and, and at different points of the run, you know, to have different proofs. And so it's, it's really important though to, to really um, be consistent from batch to batch. And that's why temperatures are the most important thing in distilling. Gotcha, so when you're running your column, you, you've ran it enough and you've done the research so you know that, that this point at 100 and, at 182 is or 184 is where your hearts start yep. and or yeah. you know wherever it may be yeah and then that's at the column and what we'll do um not round two <laughs> <laughs> i love it so in the column um in the column we can't really separate the heads or the tails you know this is the the continuous still is what i call the column gotcha. the pot still um we collect the first, usually about 25 gallons off of a 500 gallon batch, and then, um, you know, toss those and then have the rest of it. One, one way for like a, a home distiller to- <laughs> I think he's poking at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. One way for a home distiller to actually tell, and, and this is a really archaic way, but this is the way that we kind of learned how to do it, is you can tell if your heads are done. If you actually take it like a shot glass, you stick it up to your eye, and if it makes your eye kind of irritated and watered just a little bit, then you can tell that there's still heads in there. Really? If it doesn't, then you know that you're in the good stuff in the hearts. And so I know that there's probably some eye doctors or something telling, you know, <laughs> cussing me right now for saying that, but that's really the way that I used to actually tell. And so, really? but you know, after, um, you know, after running our pot still a lot, we know exactly where it is and, and, and can pay attention that way. You've got it dialed now. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny, I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, you grow it all. Yep. You grow it all within the parameters that you want. Yep. And then you malt it right here. Yep. Just so we malt everything right here. Uh, we have our own malt house where we, we malt all of our grains. We can do about a ton of grain at a time. And malt is really important because of the enzymes in the, in the process. And the easiest way to explain the importance of malt for me is we add our corn and at 200 degrees, we cook it to 200 degrees. Any more than that, it'll burn. We cool it to 165 and we add the wheat and the rye. Then, and, and at this point, it's really, the viscosity is really thick. It's very, very um, solid, you know, the, the actual liquid. And um, <laughs> so the, the viscosity is really thick. Well, you'd think by adding the barley at the end would make this already thick liquid even thicker. 
But when you add the barley at the end, it actually liquefies. The enzymes that are in the barley liquefy the starch that are in the other grains. And so this thick liquid actually gets thinner. And so that's why malt is so important. And it tastes totally different than just barley and adding commercial enzymes or anything else. And so we want to be in a state distillery. That means we have to malt our own barley and we have to do it the right way. And so um, we have our own malt system and everything else. And that's we don't we want to have total control over everything. Our trademark is called from ground to glass. So we have total control over everything from the ground to the glass. That's awesome. I mean, even <clears throat> like you were saying, using using the manure from the cows that you fed from your spent grain and then but but malting that grain like for for me malting is I mean it's a lot for, for a home brewer at all it's a lot right that's yep. why we we use the the commercially available yeah. malt but since you can do okay so you can do a thousand pounds at a time two thousand Two thousand yeah. pounds at a time holy crap so uh, <clears throat> what's that process like do you uh, so first what we do is steeping it depends on what we're malting typically it's barley um, we do malt corn on wheat and rye and other other grains um, but we'll put the barley in a steep tank we'll actually soak it in water for for 12 hours then we'll go through a rest period where we drain out the water and we just let it kind of sit there then we'll put in water again for another 12 hour period and th at this whole time, we're agitating it with, with liquid, so we're oxygenating it, we're cleaning it, um, you know, and, and it's submerged in water. Then after this, um, you know, it's absorbed all the moisture. And what, what we're trying to do here is mimic Mother Nature, you know, so you right. put a seed in the ground, you add water, so that's what we're doing there. Then we put it inside a drum, and the drum has the ideal germinating conditions. So we can control temperature, we control humidity, we control... Um, um, the, you know, airflow, we can heat it, cool it, whatever we need to do to create the ideal germinating conditions we do. And so that takes anywhere from three to six days, um, depending on what kind of grain or, you know, we're, we're producing or, or trying to malt. And so at this point, it creates this little rootlet, you know, and, and it's mimicking mother nature. What it's doing is it's putting this little tap root going down. If you're imagining it in, in the you know, in terms of, of growing. And then it's, get, it's building up all this energy that's getting ready to start growing up towards the sun. Well, that's when you stop any future, germinate, any future growth or, or germinating by drying it to a certain point to where it basically kills any future growth. So we've, but the, the easiest way is those enzymes are kind of our form of harnessing that energy that it's creating to start trying to grow up towards the sun. Right, so you create the starch, you create the enzyme, yep. and you take it, you dry it out to, and then you, from there it goes right in the mill and yep. right into the... And, and because we actually want the enzymes, and we're, you know, our, our bourbon is only about 12% barley or, or barley malt, um, we actually are okay with high proteins in our, our malt because proteins end up translating to more enzymes. So we're okay with that. Whereas a beer, you don't need that many enzymes because your majority of your, your actual product or your beer is, is malted barley. Right. And so um, you might want lower proteins, you know? And so it's kind of neat to study the relationship of brewing and distilling and, and everything else. Now, if we're making a single malt, we want much lower proteins, you know, because we don't need that, that enzyme. Right, it makes sense because you don't have as many, uh, as many grains with, that don't have diastatic power, right? Yep. Yeah, that's, I love it. So, yeah. So, one thing I really like is that you experiment. You mess around with different stuff. Uh, we were talking about the absinthe and and everything else. Um, what What's next? Do you, you guys have any? So, whiskey. And so, we've always thought that whiskey is our, our main product. We, we want whiskey to be... Um, you know, 85 to 90% of our, our products. I mean, we really feel like whiskey's where we can compete on like a national level. Um, so, uh, you know, bourbon will be our next release. We'll have rye. We make mostly bourbon. We have a little bit of rye. Um, we have single malt whiskeys, which are made just with malted barley. We have scotch style whiskeys where we actually took our own peat. What we did was we took decomposed, you know, peat is just decomposed plant matter over years and years that are built up in these bogs and they, they dig it out and burn it and they, they make that scotchy flavor and scotch, you yeah. know, the, the peaty smoky flavor. Well, what we did is we decomposed corn stalks that were grown here on the farm. We took a little bit of the powder that comes off the mill. It's like, it's almost like a flour, you know. We mix it with water, mix it with these decomposed corn stalks, pressed it in bread pans real heavy, and then dried it. 
and made these blocks of like our own peat and then smoked our, our um, malted barley with that. And so we have our own homemade peat, you know, smoked barley that's grown, you know, the barley's grown here on site, the um, smoked here, everything's done right here. It's never left our possession, you know. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. We made a quad malt where we did malted corn, malted wheat, malted rye, and malted barley in the same ratios as our bourbon. So that we'll be able to tell the difference that what malt, um, each grain malted, you know, contributes to the in flavor compared to grains that aren't malted. Um, we've made oat whiskey. Oat whiskey was really interesting. It tasted like blueberries right out of the, off the still. It was crazy, like blueberries. And like a month later, it tasted like bacon. It's really weird. So it goes from blueberries to bacon, and then like a, after a year in the barrel, it tasted like oatmeal cookies. And then now it just kind of tastes like a, a real, kind of like an earthy, you know, it's got this earthy flavor to it. I kind of call it like the Pinot Noir of the whiskey worlds, you know, it's kind of got this earthy, dirty, kind of mellow taste to yeah. it. So anyways, that, one's, that one will be kind of fun. Yeah. Very cool, man. I, I love how much you guys experiment. Like I said, that's uh, <clears throat> so with with the oat. Uh, how how? <laughs> so yeah, so oats a pain in the butt because it has oats are sixty percent holes. Holes are the little protective coating around the actual seed. Yeah. And so those holes cause a huge problem in the distillation process and the fermentation process, everything. So now we're growing a, a new variety of oats called naked oats. They they don't have holes on them. And um, by growing our own grain, we can do that. We couldn't find any seed anywhere in the United States. We actually had to have the seed shipped in from Canada to grow it. And now we, we grow our own seed from year to year now. So that was kind of fun, but, but that's one, th one, one more thing. We can grow the different varieties, the important varieties, the best varieties for each one for our specific purposes. So there's, there's hundreds of varieties of malting barley. Right. Well, we can pick which kind we want. We can pick the, the wholeness oats if we grow it ourselves. And, and really fine tune them to make the high quality products. There's a saying in the wine industry that you can't make good wine out of bad grapes. It's gotta be the same thing in the distilling world. You can't make good whiskey out of, out of bad grains. And by growing it ourselves, we ensure quality. Um, a lot of distilleries, the big guys, they'll take seconds, they call them seconds corn, you know, and things like that. And there's really nothing wrong with it, but they're just all kind of the, the lesser grade, not quite as good a quality corn. The good quality corn gets into, you know, corn nuts or, you know, all the, the perfect pretty corn, you know? And then the kind of the B grade, the distilleries um, throughout history, that was a way of them to get rid of their, you know, their kind of off grade stuff. And so we don't want to do that. We want to use the best quality grains and start off with the best quality grains. That's, that's awesome. You're like, well, that was a pain in the ass. You know what? We're going to grow an acre of this kind and we're gonna see how it goes. Yeah, we, we try, we will not do anything that cuts corners. If it makes it easier, it doesn't matter. If there's something that, you know, that, that we can do to make better quality, we do it. There's a saying in the wine industry too, so we also make wine. Right. And uh, we, we always say, you gotta like what you make because you might end up drinking it all yourself. <laughs> so we gotta make sure we like everything yeah, too. Absolutely. So we, we don't wanna cut any corners, we do everything the right way. Heck yeah, man, I love it. Yeah, because it, it makes sense if you're, if you're putting bad stuff into a barrel. Yeah, barrels are magic, yeah. but they're not that magic. I mean, yeah. crap goes in, crap comes out. And we had um, a really professional whiskey, um, you know, I don't know what the word is, but a whiskey, you know, whiskey. some yay, but they don't like to be called that. <laughs> but um, come here and, and she tasted her whiskey, said, this is fantastic, but I want to taste your unaged whiskey and your two-year-old barreled whiskey because I want to see what the barrels are covering up. And I thought that's a pretty good point that she made because the barrels do cover up a lot of off flavors. And she tried her unaged whiskey and our two-year-old whiskey. And she said, this is fantastic. This is some really good quality, you know, product to begin with. And I can tell that your barrels are not covering anything up, which I can tell in a lot of distilleries, that's why they have to age it eight, 10 years because they're covering up some off flavors that could be in the whiskey. Right. And um, so we're really, really excited. I'm really excited. <laughs> okay, so you can you can check out uh, so on the market right now. Yep. Vodka and gin are available. Yep. Vodka gin, absinthe. Absinthe. Uh huh. And then we have a barrel aged gin, um, and we have a uh, brandy. Yep. So the brandy is actually under the Churchill Vineyards label, which is um, our our wine because brandy is made from distilling 
wine, and so that's our, our under our other label. The Frey Ranch is all of our grain-based products, so the wheat, rye, barley, corn, oats, you know, whatever grain products. Okay. So Churchill Vineyards for wine. So what, what kind of wines do you guys do? So the ones that grow really well here are the whites particularly. So we grow a lot of Riesling, Gewürztraminer, and Chardonnay, and Semillon. Now the reds that are actually doing pretty well, that, we, that are kind of later, they're just coming on right now. We just released a Malbec. And then we have a, one that's called a Limburger. And Limburger is kind of a weird name. They grow it a lot in Washington State. And they, they say that it, it's the best seller in a lot of the tasting rooms, but the worst seller at the liquor store or supermarket shelf because of the name, you yeah. know? But when people taste it, they like it. It's kind of a nice fruity wine, not really acidic. It doesn't, you know, some wines give me heartburn almost immediately. Yeah. This is one of those ones that doesn't, that you can drink every day. Nice, very nice. So, and then you're, you're all over, you're, you're, you're distributed nationally, yeah? Well, kind of. So we're, we're kind of holding off. Um, we're distributed in several states. But um, we will be national when we get the whiskey out because that's, you know, that's our main product. And, and so our first release of whiskey will be about 4,000 cases, um, 48,000 bottles. Um, but this year alone, we're set to produce 65,000 cases of whiskey that we'll be putting in wood. 65,000 cases? Cases, yeah. Holy crap. I love it. So, so we're not going to run out no, once it hits the market is, is what you're saying. Well, well, hopefully we will, but, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll be able to get at least a couple of bottles, yeah. is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we'll be able to set you up. <laughs> Love it. Can't yeah. wait. Okay, so you can find all the products from Churchill Vineyards and Frey Ranch Estate Distillery all over Nevada um, and a couple other states, you said? Yep. In, so, yeah, we're in California. Um, and really, we're trying to focus on Nevada and California. We want to own our home market before we branch out. Awesome. you know, and go too much further. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So all over Nevada, uh, in California as well, and just pick up a bottle, you will love this stuff. It's, it, it's really, really impressive, and it's, it's crazy cool to see how much work these guys actually put into literally going from ground to glass. And, and they're, like Colby said, their their hands are in it every step of the way. They're they're literally doing everything. Okay, so you can you can find wine from Churchill Vineyards, brand, wine and brandy from Churchill Vineyards, and distillates from Frey Ranch Estate Distillery all over Nevada and California. And you guys also have a tasting room. Yep. Uh, here in Fallon. Yeah, we're open every Saturday from 12 to 4. We have free tastings and tours for anybody that wants to come out. Love it. Love it, love it. And you have to come out and check out their facility because it's insane. It's awesome. You can also follow Frey Ranch Distillery on Instagram, Facebook, all the social media stuff, at Frey Ranch Distillery. And I really appreciate you letting us come out and take up your morning and showing us all, the, all your fun toys. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Anytime. We'll be back. <laughs> Brew on. <laughs>